I'm Sergeant Josh Hopper, United States Marine Corps. I've been in for about right five and a half years. I've had one deployment to Africa and two deployments to Iraq. It was while I was in VMFA 115 as the executive officer that I knew Sergeant Hopper. He did two tours in Iraq as an infantry marine, as a saw gunner. On his first deployment, he fired thousands and thousands of rounds from his weapon, saw lots of casualties, and experienced battle on a daily basis throughout his deployment. On his second one, he employed his weapon only one or two times, but uh, saw more and more uh, IEDs. In fact, he received a Purple Heart for injuries he sustained as a result of an IED. We've been married a little over four years. We have two children. I've known my husband since I was probably like nine, and actually he chased after me for quite a few years before I'd have anything to do with him. And then we got married when I was 17. Hug, have a kiss. Good day, kiss. Before the PTSD, Josh was very social. He liked people. He was very friendly, very affectionate, showed his affection. If he loves you, he loves you, period, you knew it. After the PTSD, um, he was really distant. He didn't have much to do with me. Um, of course, we had a newborn baby, so that was all on me too. He didn't, he didn't, he almost like didn't care. He would go to work before the sun came up. He would come home after the sun came down. He would eat, drink, and go to bed for eight months. Then he deployed the second time. Then when he came back from that deployment, it was worse. Uh, Sergeant Hopper, when he joined the squadron, came to me as one of my S2 uh, intel clerks. He was a lat move uh, from the infantry. He gives you his heart, uh, puts everything into uh, anything that he does, and uh, gives you a lot of confidence. Not only was he this big physical specimen of a Marine who could push around more weights than just about anybody else in the squadron, but uh, he also was, was a kind man. He was always very professional, uh, did his job, and did it well. To the outside world, he could hide it. To my family, to his family, close friends of the family, he couldn't hide it. He always had that, um, when you looked at him, a distant look. He never looked like he was actually in the same room with you. You could look at his face and know he was in another country. He wasn't here anymore. I was distant not only from my wife, but everybody in my family. You know, I stopped, you know, where it would be, I'd call my mom and dad, you know, two or three times a week. Well, they would call me two or three times a week because I wasn't calling them and I would just hit the ignore button. Mood swings was a big thing. Drinking a lot. I really just pretty much wanted to stay to myself, you know. If I had a bad day at work, you know, I would come, I wouldn't take it out on anybody at work or anybody I worked with. I'd come home and I'd take it out on those who were closest to me. We fought constantly. I couldn't even enjoy being around my own kids. I couldn't just enjoy, you know, going out for a walk anymore. Pretty much all I did was I'd come home from work, you know, pour a drink of some sorts and just sit there until I fell asleep and wake up and go to work the next morning. Came to work every day, we talked about baseball, talked about the squadron, talked about deploying, where we were going, what we were doing. Uh, even the deployment to Iraq never seemed to raise any concerns with him that I saw. Um, but it was not until the day that we gave him that award that um, the light went on in our head that he may be dealing with something we need to help him with. And as Sergeant Major was reading the award, I realized that Sergeant Hopper was reliving uh, what had happened at that time, shaking, um, cold sweats, uh, and it was all happening there within 30 seconds of reading the award. And I realized that I needed to engage him and make sure he was good and make sure everything was going fine. And that was kind of the first uh, presentation that I saw of symptoms or something that wasn't quite right. He approached me just like any other Marine. He's, we sat down on a picnic table. He was right in front of me. He goes, what's bothering you? He knew something was up. And I told him, I said, I'm about to lose it, sir. You know, I've got to. I started telling him everything that had been going on. And I said, I've got to do something. I've let this go too long to where I can't sleep. All I think about is, you know, these negative thoughts. You know, I've pushed my family away. I said, I've been getting up every morning, coming to work, making y'all think everything's fine, but really I'm just putting a mask on and you're not seeing what's, you know, going on the inside or what's going on at home. And I said, I've got to do something about it. And he was nothing but supportive of it. The CO actually personally picked up the phone and uh, started searching for the experts. The medical care uh, specialists uh, right here at Beaufort Neville Hospital knew exactly who to point us towards, and the CO lined up inpatient treatment uh, in Martinsburg, West Virginia. 
it seemed like from that day on, when I would go to get treatment, you know, go to my classes, things like that, things started getting better. Um, after my three months was up there, I came back. He was uh, on his way to uh, return into full health and, and clearances and everything else, and I said, bring him back. I'm, you know, he's part of us, and let's go. And he came back in and checked in at my door, and I said, all right, get to work, let's go. <laughs> and uh, it's been great. I know if I didn't have a CO like him and a command like I had, and the kind of family I had, that I might have not made it through this and gotten better. My wife supported me basically by being there. She straight up told me, I've never been in your shoes. I haven't went and done what you've done. And she goes, I never will. She goes, all I can tell you is I'll be here when you get back. I'll be here if you need me. And so will the kids. We're only a phone call or a flight away. Having my husband back is a great thing because I can actually have a relationship with my spouse and not with Wall because <laughs> that's pretty much all I talked to him before he decided, you know, hey, I do need help and I can ask for help. And that was probably the hardest thing for him. It wasn't that I was afraid that, you know, my command was gonna look down on me or they wasn't gonna be there to support me or I'd be black label or nothing like that. I think it had, I basically had to swallow that lump they call pride in your throat. Uh, I haven't thought any different of him. As a matter of fact, uh, I actually respect him and trust him more now uh, because of the fact that he had a problem, he had an issue, he brought it to me. Together we figured it out, um, we fixed it and he's as good or better Marine now as, and in the future. I mean, he, he's a trusted agent for me. Sergeant Hopper's been an inspiration. It, uh, his actions, uh, how he dealt with this, uh, like a man, like a Marine, uh, as, as a noble Marine, uh, inspires us all to do better. Right now, uh, he, can, he can do whatever he wants. He, he's got an unlimited future in the Marine Corps. There's not a commanding officer out there or a leadership staff out there that doesn't want to help. Um, it's sometimes challenging for a young Marine to come to a, a senior staff member or senior officer in the, in the unit and tell him he's got a problem. Um, we're all Marines. I'm just, just like the rest of them. I just want to help and uh, just like they do. So um, don't hesitate. <laughs> come ask. I think it takes real strength for um, anyone to go get help for psychological issues being active duty in the military, you're kind of, you know, branded with a, oh, he's, a he's the tough guy, you know, he's the, either the Marine, the soldier, the sailor, you know, the airman, you know, they go fight our wars for, you know, keep our country free. You already kind of got a chip on your, a chip's been put on your shoulder that those kind of things aren't, you know, supposed to bother you or get to you. So it all comes back to, it takes real strength to swallow your pride and to say, I need help and to go actually get the help.